Relax and listen to the voice. Hello to everyone. This installment brings us into the weird world of conspiracies. We are not here to confirm, deny, push, or promote any conspiracy theories. We are here to tell the tales. If any of these pique your interest, feel free to do your own research and form your own opinions on them. And with that, away we go. The Dyatlov Pass Incident On the 1st of February in 1959, nine Russian hikers on the track of a lifetime through the Ural Mountains pitched a tent and settled in for the night. Some hours later, all nine apparently fled the safety of the tent and perished in the freezing, snowy conditions. Some of the people within the trekking party succumbed to hypothermia, but others were found with grisly, strange injuries. The Dyatlov Pass incident, as it came to be known, has inspired many, many dark and often outlandish potential explanations. This is what we know to be factual so far. This group of hikers originally consisted of 10 highly experienced hikers who were, with one key exception, all students and recent graduates from the Ural Polytechnical Institute. The one exception in the group was Alexander Zolotarev, a last minute addition to the group, at age 37, far older than all of the others. In the early stages of the trek, one member of the group dropped out due to ill health. The rest carried on, taking photos of each other, larking about, and recording diary entries that expressed their excitement about the adventure to come. One of them wrote, I wonder what awaits us on this trip. I wonder what we will encounter. Weeks later, a search party sent to locate the missing hikers found the remains of their tent on the side of a mountain called Kolat Siako. Inside of the tent were the hikers' boots, clothes, and maps, along with some food that was laid out, presumably for a meal. The side of the tent had been slashed open from the inside, which could indicate that the people inside were desperate to get out. Footprints in the snow made it clear that the group had left the tent without any shoes. At the base of a nearby tree, next to an extinguished campfire, lay the corpses of 21-year-old Yuri Doroshenko and 23-year-old Yuri Kervonoshenko. Both had seemingly froze to death, but also exhibited burn marks and multiple abrasions on their bodies. Not far away from these two, Lying in the snow were the bruised, battered bodies of the group's leader, 23-year-old Igor Dyatlov and 22-year-old Zineda Komogorova. It looked like both of these people had been trying to return to the tent when they had died. Some days after the discovery of these bodies, the body of 23-year-old Rustem Slobodin was also discovered. Rustem had a fractured skull. The remaining bodies of the hikers were found in a ravine near a shelter they'd attempted to carve out of the snow. One of them, a 23-year-old graduate, had a caved-in skull, while another, 24-year-old Alexander Kolovatov, had a deformed neck and was missing his eyebrows. The oldest hiker, Alexander Zolotaryov, a 20-year-old Ludmilia Dubinina, had crushed chests with multiple broken ribs. Both of them were missing their eyes, and Ludemilia's tongue was gone. A criminal investigation was carried out by a prosecutor named Lev Ivanov, but it came to a cryptic conclusion. The report stated, The cause of their demise was an overwhelming force which the hikers were not able to overcome. One theory about what had happened on the Dyatlov Pass is the espionage theory. The theory goes something like this. There were two members of the Dyatlov group, and they had been the focus of particular speculation. Why was Alexander Zolyartov, a 37-year-old veteran of World War II, 
attached to this group of young students and graduates. On top of that, it's significant that only a few years earlier, Yuri Ravonishenko helped clear up a radioactive leak at a secret Soviet nuclear facility, an incident which was covered up and has since been loosely compared to the Chernobyl disaster. According to a theory, Zolotaryov, Krivonoshenko, and potentially even a third hiker were working for the KGB and had joined the Dyatlov track in order to rendezvous with CIA agents in the Ural Mountain. The theory goes on to expound on the possibility that, while handing over the radioactive materials and fake nuclear secrets, these Russians were supposed to take photos of the American agents. The end of this theory suggests that the CIA men got wise to what was going on, leading to a fight breaking out, which eventually led to the massacre of the Dyatlov party. Another theory is the Manzi theory. Early on it was theorized by Soviet authorities that the Dyatlov party may have been killed by the Manzi, an indigenous people of the region. The idea persisted for some time that the hikers were slaughtered for straying on the sacred land or that perhaps they were killed as part of a shamanistic ritual. There was much focus on the fact that there was the presence of a Manzi chum or a dwelling in the nearby vicinity of the hikers' tent. Zinedia Kolmogorova noted in her diary, We often see Manzi signs on the trail. I wonder what they write about while one of her fellow hikers, whose identity remains unclear, also recorded in their diary, Monzi writings appear on trees. The writings are all sorts of obscure, mysterious characters. As time has gone by, this theory has been primarily debunked as a baseless theory rooting in misunderstanding of the Monzi culture and rituals. And, if they were indeed rounded up and murdered, why were the bodies found in different locations some of them more injured than others. Another theory surrounds UFOs and military weapons. In 1990, Lev Ivanov, the man who had led the initial investigation into the incident, published a sensational article claiming that he'd been ordered to censor some of his key findings. In particular, the unusual char marks on trees near the bodies were found, which, in Ivanov's view, confirmed a source of some sort of heat ray that had been purposefully aimed at some of the helpless hikers. Ivanov's article also alleged that floating balls of light and other weird phenomena had been reported all over the Ural Mountains in February during the year of the incident. Ivanov definitely didn't mince his words, saying that, based on the evidence gathered, the role of the UFOs in this tragedy is quite obvious. Some theorize that there was possibly a cryptid involvement. The idea that the group was killed by a yeti rests on a few pieces of very dubious evidence. The first photo is a photo taken by one of the doomed hikers which shows a dark humanoid figure seemingly hiding by a tree. But was this a fearsome figure from cryptozoology or simply a blurry image of one of the other hikers? The second item cited by those who believe that a Yeti may have had part in this incident is a parody newspaper that the hikers wrote during the expedition, which contained the line, The Yeti lives in the northern Urals, near Mount Torton. While this was clearly intended to be a joke by the hikers, other stories in the parody newspaper were exaggerated accounts of things the hikers really did. So, according to this theory, a satirical entry on the Yeti was inspired by a real sighting of the creature which stalked and eventually killed the entire group. Lastly, we come to the most widely accepted theory about the incident on the Dyatlov Pass. This theory states that the group fled their tent because of a slab avalanche and then, once outside of the tent, succumbed to the harsh conditions of the snowy wilderness. A slab avalanche is an avalanche where a compacted block of snow slides down the mountain slope once the underlying weaker snow layer gives away. This theory supposes that a combination of factors, including mountain winds and a weakening of the mountain snow while the hikers were pitching their tent, 
could have led to the catastrophic avalanche. The theory goes that once the avalanche hit, the group slashed their way out of the tent in a panic, with some of them severely injured by the impact of the avalanche, which could explain the broken ribs suffered by Zaliotarov or Dubanina, for example. The hikers who escaped with mild cuts and abrasions likely tried to help the others flee what they assumed was a danger zone for a full-scale avalanche, only for the whole group to perish from the intense cold or from their injuries. An alternate theory within this realm is that all nine hikers may have escaped the crushed tent without serious injuries, which would explain why there were no tracks in the snow, suggesting that people had been assisted or had their bodies drugged through the snow. Assuming this is the case, sometime thereafter, two of the hikers would succumb to death due to the cold nearby a tree. Three of them would have frozen to death trying to get back to the tent, and four others would have died by the ravine, some of them being badly injured or killed while trying to create a snow shelter. The gruesome facial damage discovered on some of the bodies could have possibly been the result of an animal scavenger as well as decomposition. There are a few other theories floating around about this incident, which include the possibility of supernatural or paranormal entities and occurrences. The Montauk Project is an alleged series of secret United States government projects conducted at Camp Hero, or Montauk Air Force Station, on Montauk, Long Island, for the purpose of developing psychological warfare techniques and exotic research including time travel. Jacques Vallée describes allegations of the Montauk Project as an outgrowth of stories based on the Philadelphia Experiment. The history of the Montauk Project story is closely associated with, and often believed to originate in, the Montauk Project series of books by Preston Nichols. Stories about the Montauk Project have circulated since the early 1980s. According to one UFO researcher, the Montauk Experiment stories seem to have originated with the account of Preston Nichols, who claimed to have recovered repressed memories of his own involvement in activities at Montauk. These memories center around topics including United States government and military experimentations in fields such as time travel, teleportation, mind control, contact with alien life, and staging the faked Apollo moon landings. Allegedly, these all culminate in a hole being ripped in the space-time continuum in 1983. The Montauk Project is believed by small members of people in extension or a continuation of the controversial Philadelphia Experiment which supposedly took place on October 28, 1943. According to the legend, sometime in the 1950s, surviving researchers from Project Rainbow began to discuss the project with an eye to continuing the research into technical aspects of manipulating the electromagnetic bottle that had been used to make the USS Eldridge quote-unquote invisible, as well as the reasons and possible military applications of the psychological effects of that magnetic field. The theory goes on to say that a report was supposedly prepared and presented to Congress and was soundly rejected as being far, far too dangerous. After that, a proposal was made and given directly to the Department of Defense, promising a powerful new weapon that could drive enemies insane, inducing symptoms of schizophrenia at the touch of a button. And how would they make this happen without congressional approval? Well, the project would have to be top secret and secretly funded. Allegedly, the Department of Defense approved, and the funding supposedly came from a cache of $10 billion in Nazi gold that was recovered from a train found by U.S. soldiers in a tunnel in France. As the story goes here, the train was blown up and all of the soldiers were killed. When the funds from that train ran out, additional funding was secured from ITT and the Krupp AG in Germany. Work on the Montauk project 
allegedly began at Brookhaven National Laboratory on Long Island, New York, under the name of the Phoenix Project. But it was soon realized that the project required a large radar dish, and installing one at Brookhaven would compromise the security of the project. As luck would have it, the U.S. Air Force had a decommissioned base at Montauk, New York, not very far from Brookhaven, which had a complete SAGE radar already installed. This site at Montauk was large and remote, and water access would allow equipment to be moved in and out undetected. Equipment was allegedly moved to Camp Hero at the Montauk base in the late 1960s and installed in an underground bunker beneath the base. According to those that promote this conspiracy, to hide the true nature of the project, the site was closed down in 1969 and donated as a wildlife refuge park with a specific provision included that everything underground would remain the property of the U.S. Air Force. One large hole in this portion of the conspiracy theory is that, in reality, there are official documents that state the base remained in operation until the 1980s. The Wildlife and Refuge Park was never open to the public under the guise and excuse of environmental contaminations. Those who push this conspiracy theory claim that the experiments began in the early 1980s. They claim that in these years, some or all of the following things have occurred at the site. No evidence has ever been provided that any of these following occurrences are actually true. There are claims that the facility was expanded to as many as 12 levels and several hundred workers. Some of these reports have the facility extending down under the town of Montauk itself. There are claims that homeless people and orphans were abducted and subjected to huge amounts of electromagnetic radiation in order to test mind control technology and remote brain programming. Allegedly, very few of these abductees survived. There are claims that people had their psychic abilities enhanced to the point where they could materialize objects out of thin air. A man named Stuart Swerdlow claims to have been involved in the Montauk project, and as a result, he says that his psionic faculties were boosted, but at the cost of emotional instability, post-traumatic stress disorder, and various other mental issues. There are reports that an alien supposedly designed a chair which an individual could sit in to boost his mental and precipitatory powers. A duplicate prototype of this chair was allegedly given to England and put into a facility somewhere on the Thames River. There are stories that teleportation experiments had been conducted. Some say that there was a portal in time that was created which allowed researchers to travel anywhere in time or space. This theory goes on to state that this was developed into a stable time tunnel of sorts, and allegedly underground tunnels with abandoned cultural archives were explored on Mars using this technique. There are stories about contact being made with alien extraterrestrials through this time tunnel and exchanging technology with them which also enhanced the Montauk project. Apparently, the technology exchange allowed the military a much broader access to what they called hyperspace. Some say that mind control experiments were conducted and runaway and kidnapped boys were abducted and brought out to the base where they underwent excruciating periods of both physical and mental torture in order to break their minds and then their minds were reprogrammed. Many of these boys were supposedly killed during the process and buried on the site. Other boys were released with their reprogrammed minds and used as mind slaves with alternate personalities to make them sleeper cells who could be activated to perform missions for the military. One of the alleged occurrences is that around August 12th of 1983, the time travel project at Camp Hero interlocked in hyperspace with the original Rainbow Project back in 1943. During this, the USS Eldridge was drawn into hyperspace and trapped there. Two men, Al Bielek and Duncan Cameron, 
both claimed to have leapt from the deck of the Eldridge while it was in hyperspace and ended up, after a period of severe disorientation, back at Camp Hero in the year of 1983. Here they claimed to have met a man named John von Neumann, a famous physicist and mathematician, even though he was known to have died in 1957. Von Neumann had supposedly worked on the original Philadelphia experiment, but the U.S. Navy denies any claims of that. Their belief that flying saucers were allegedly observed over the Philadelphia experiment in 1943, and they were sucked into a time warp and were transported to one of the underground tunnels in Montauk, where they became stuck. The aliens upon the UFO demanded a large quartz crystal to help get their ship's engine started in order for them to leave. At this point, according to this belief, the time tunnel was used in order to travel and obtain one from another planet. Nikolai Tesla, whose death was faked in a conspiracy, was allegedly the chief director of operations at the Montauk base. Mass psychological experiments, such as the use of enormous subliminal message projects and the creation of a Men in Black Corp to confuse and frighten the public, were also invented there. In an extremely recent twist, the former professional wrestler Rob Van Dam claims to have accidentally stumbled upon the area while driving to an arena. According to Rob Van Dam's claim, during one hour's time, he went into the time tunnel and claimed to have met Nikolai Tesla, who told him that he was going to return in 2007 to put an end to it all. This site was finally open to the public on September 18th of 2002 as Camp Hero State Park. The radar tower has been placed on the State and National Register of Historic Places. There are plans for a museum and an interpretive center focusing on World War II and Cold War era history. And despite rumors, no traces of secret underground facilities have ever been found, although on the grounds of Camp Hero, there is a visible hill with sealed concrete doors. MK Ultra was a top secret CAA mind control research program that ran from 1953 through 1973. It has been the subject of numerous conspiracy theories since it was made public in 1975. Some of these conspiracy theory claim that various assassins and mass shooters, or MK Ultra puppets, manipulated by the government into carrying out their attacks. Donald Ewan Cameron is known for his brainwashing experiments at the Allen Memorial Institute in Montreal which took place in the late 1950s and the early 1960s. Also known as Subproject 68 of the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, Project MKUltra, these experiments played a significant role in the CIA's quest to harness mind control as a weapon during the Cold War. The most well-known narrative around Cameron is that of an accomplice to military torture a man who sold his soul to the CIA and knowingly destroyed the lives of healthy patients. However, this may not be entirely accurate. According to Cameron's published research, his theories of psychic driving began before he was even contacted indirectly by the CIA and originated as a possible treatment for mental disorders. Throughout Cameron's career, much of his work was focused on searching for a cure for schizophrenia and his depatterning treatments that devastated many lives began with the same goal. Moreover, the CIA officers communicating with Cameron claimed to be from the Society for the Investigation of Human Ecology, so it is entirely likely that Cameron was never aware his research was intended to be used for military purposes. 
In addition, Cameron was one of the psychiatrists present at the Nuremberg trials to evaluate the mental capacity of the accused. These trials served as a lesson to the world on the importance of ethical research practices and, like most people, Cameron concluded that the experiments discussed in the Nuremberg trials were horrific. So we're left with the question, how did Cameron become the mind behind such heinous experiments? Going back to the Cold War era of the 1950s, the possibility of a nuclear war with the Soviet Union was such an existential threat that the CIA was determined to make use of the most powerful weapon that they could, which was the human mind. Mind control was nothing new to the CIA. In the early 1950s, Project Bluebird was already testing the waters. When Sidney Gottlieb was hired to the CIA in 1951, his then supervisor, Alan Dules, instructed him to advance the field. Project Bluebird was expanded and soon became named Project Artichoke, which was led by Gottlieb. Determined to keep up in the arms race during the Cold War, American researchers, led by Gottlieb, began experimenting with interrogation techniques and the use of psychotropic drugs, much of which would now be classified as torture. After extensive research in the mind control techniques, Gottlieb set out to establish a bigger, more ambitious project to discover the secrets of brain warfare. And once and for all, in 1953, Gottlieb's proposal was approved by his supervisor, which from then on became known as MKUltra. A multitude of psychiatrists were recruited to be a part of this team, such as Dr. James Hamilton, Dr. Robert Hyde, and Dr. Lewis Joylin West. Dr. James Hamilton became the researcher behind subprojects 2, 124, and 140. Subproject 2 examined how the synergistic activity of drugs could eradicate consciousness completely, as well as ways to drug a person without their knowledge. Subproject 124 tested whether inhaling carbon monoxide gas would induce a trance, and Subproject 140 tested the psychological effects of thyroid hormones. Dr. Robert Hyde coordinated subprojects 8, 10, 63, and 66, which studied the effects of psychotropic drugs, in particular LSD-25 and alcohol. West was in charge of testing disassociative drugs. As these drugs were a key area of research, pharmacies and pharmacologists were also key allies in the creation of MKUltra. The American pharmaceutical company, Eli Lilly, was behind subprojects 6 and 18, where the CIA paid them for bulk purchases of LSD, making subproject 18 the most expensive subcontract in history. Cameron developed a theory of what he called psychic driving, where the minds of the patients were manipulated using verbal cues that were played repeatedly. The objective of this was to bring repressed thoughts to the forefront of the patient's mind so that they could identify them. The verbal cues could be recordings of the patient's own speech or recordings that were spoken by an experimenter. One study was that of a 40-year-old female patient recording her own verbal cues on high-fidelity magnetic tape. This woman was then forced to listen to her own emotionally charged statement, which was, If you don't keep quiet, I'm going to leave you behind. This statement was originally said to her by her mother, and it stayed with her for all of her life. After this verbal cue repeated 45 times, the patient expressed that she was under distress and begged the experimenter to stop playing it. She then turned red and began to hyperventilate, shake, and continued to shake until after the recording was stopped. This technique of psychic driving, or heteropsychic driving, was also used on patients for 10 to 12 hours, even sometimes during their sleep. 
Sodium amyl barbitol was also used to put patients into what would be described as a clinical coma in order to extend the periods of psychic driving for up to 20 hours a day over a period of 10 to 15 days. Psychological isolation techniques were also used to decrease defense mechanisms where a patient would be placed into a dark, quiet room with goggles covering their eyes and they would be prevented from touching their own bodies as a way of interfering with their self-image and decreasing their expressive outflow. During these experiments, Cameron carefully observed and cataloged the patient's responses, ultimately identifying six major classes of these responses. One 50-year-old patient, after listening to the recorded statement, that said, That's what I can't understand, that someone could strike a little child, showed an immediately constructive response, showing severe distress after 10 repetitions. A 28-year-old woman, listening to a statement based on her childhood difficulties with her father, showed a partial block, according to Cameron. The intensity of feelings from the experiment led to the woman having a reduced ability to communicate with her therapist. One young woman demonstrated a rejection and escape response after listening to a statement on her supposed sexual desire for her father. She became angry and hostile towards her therapist and then quit therapy until she was later admitted to an inpatient treatment as being deeply disturbed. A response which was called continued action was seen in one anxiety patient who after listening to a reassuring statement over a period of eight days stated that she found a reassurance in this statement when she felt afraid. And finally, a response titled Development of Defenses was seen after long periods of heteropsychic driving, including once in a woman who underwent a minimum of 25 hours of psychic driving, partially under the effects of LSD-25. The woman later stated that she could not remember certain themes of the psychic driving sessions, such as giving up drinking, and instead had an urge to drink more, which Cameron went on to describe as an inversion of one of the heteropsychic driving themes. So there we have it. Allegedly MK Ultra is a true experiment. It doesn't seem that ethical though, does it? giving patients drugs and essentially subliminally trying to affect their consciousness and their actions? It doesn't seem like something that's on the up and up. Some conspiracy theories associated with MK Ultra are that many celebrities have been a part of and affected by MK Ultra. Have you seen footage of a celebrity going blank, forgetting their lines, or acting strange? One of these encounters that conspiracy theorists blamed on MKUltra was in 2018 when rapper Cardi B unexpectedly stared into space during a red carpet interview at the Grammys. Conspiracy theorists and internet denizens didn't blame it on exhaustion or nerves or the fact that she may have just panicked, had a technical difficulty with audio, or even considered the rare possibility that she might have just frozen with stage fright. According to these people, the lapse in concentration that Cardi B succumbed to was a clear sign that she was the victim of the CIA's MK Ultra mind control program, and the bizarre blank expression on her face was clear evidence of a glitch in her programming. The conspiracy theory also extends to much more sinister acts as well, and it's often referenced in combination with other conspiracy theories. A quick internet search would show you that there are hundreds of threads in online chat rooms that suggest that attacks from gunmen, including school shootings such as Sandy Hook and Columbine, were not terrorists, fanatics, or disturbed kids, but rather MK Ultra puppets who were being conducted to carry out these atrocities for an unknown and unseen benefit. This particular conspiracy theory usually leads back to fears of gun control or having the government confiscate our firearms within the United States. A strange thing that can lend credence to these conspiracy theories when discussing MKUltra 
is that there are actual documented reports that the U.S. government is not above committing horrible acts against their citizens in order to develop new tactics for fighting the enemy. What is subliminal advertising? We will read you an excerpt from a story published on September 16, 1957. New York. Market researcher James M. Vickery today unveiled his new secret weapon for advertisers, the invisible commercial. It is based on the theory of subliminal projection. Assuming that the idea is feasible, this will enable advertisers to flash sales messages on TV without the viewers being consciously aware of them. The messages will reach the audiences subliminally, that is, below the threshold of sensation or awareness. Mr. Vickery showed reporters a film interlaced with Coca-Cola commercials. The Coke messages were flashed at the rate of one every five seconds and only a few of them were detected by the audience. Mr. Vickery explained that these few were visible because he rigged the mechanism so that the reporters could see what was being done invisibly. Mr. Vickery, head of the motivation research company bearing his name, said the commercial messages are superimposed on a film as very brief overlays of light. They're so rapid up to one three thousandths of a second that they cannot actually be visually seen by the audience, rather just noticed. Mr. Vickery reported that he recently tested the invisible commercial in a New Jersey movie theater. The test ran for six weeks, during which time some 45,000 persons attended showings in the theater. Two advertising messages were projected. One urging the audience to eat popcorn, and the other suggesting, drink Coca-Cola. According to Mr. Vickery, the invisible commercial increased popcorn sales by 57.5%, and Coca-Cola sales jumped up by 18.1%. Mr. Vickery emphasized that his subliminal ads are useful only as reminder advertising. They will not, he said, move a person to switch brands. Mr. Vickery states that subliminal advertising will be a boon to the consumer because it will eliminate bothersome commercials and it will allow for more entertainment time. So what is the modern version of this? We've all had something strange happen to us recently with the advent of cell phones. Some people say that our phones are always on, they're always recording, and they're always listening. And in all honesty, if you are actually to read the agreements for some of the applications that you have on your cell phones, it does allow for the apps to kind of just check in on you, supposedly, at whatever time they decide to. Have you been outside with one or two of your good friends talking about purchasing a new item for your landscape? Maybe a swimming pool, or a fire pit, or maybe even some kind of shade device, like a tent canopy, or a sun sail, only to then later be astounded when scrolling through social media and see advertisements about the items that you had just been discussing? Some people say that we're just now noticing these advertisements due to the recent conversation about them. Others say that our devices have been listening in, and that manufacturers are paying the companies to place and promote ads in connection to what they've heard us speaking about. The potential to have subliminal advertising used through your cellular devices, tablets, and television lends credence to the ideas of subliminal priming. Subliminal priming is the showing of a stimulus that has some effect on a person without the participant having an actual conscious recall of the stimulus. Subliminal goal priming is a practice in showing people stimuli to increase the likelihood of goal-oriented behavior. 
There are theories that the company Facebook participated in something similar to this, to where certain users were only shown negative posts, negative news stories, and social media content containing upsetting images, wording, and tones to them. According to this, another test group was also given the opposite of positive imagery, positive wording, positive posts, things that contained love, relationships, sexuality, images of people outdoors having fun on beaches or playing games, smiling, laughing, etc., etc. After the exposure, there were allegedly tests done to check the amount of usage that the users had, the amount and type of content that the users responded to, as well as the personal output from the users by the way of their own personal posts, uploads, and interactions following a short period of experimentation. As we had heard in the article that was read at the intro of this section, subliminal advertising was suggested. Around 1972, a college professor named Wilson Brian Key became a new champion of the idea of subliminal advertising. Key published a book entitled Subliminal Seduction, which, as it turned out, would be the first of five books published between 1972 and 1992, each book sharing essentially the same message. The paperback edition of Subliminal Seduction contained what may be one of the most provocative book covers ever. It features a large central photograph of a mixed drink, large ice cubes, a clear liquid such as a martini and a twist of lemon in a drink glass, and with this caption in red letters, Are you being sexually aroused by this picture? This book went on to be a bestseller. I mean, who could resist the pitch? An explanation of sexual arousal? The book contained a restatement of claims by Vickery, along with some new evidence from Key and some of his students. He argued that advertisers embed images of body parts like breasts and genitals, wild animals, and other stimulating or terrifying images in ads. The embeddings are not immediately obvious to readers, but they're picked up on subliminally and interpreted by our unconscious minds. We're then stimulated by them and ultimately motivated to purchase or interact or identify with the advertised products and the brands that use them. Key discusses evidence from research findings and other sources that support the ideas of motivational research in general and subliminal communication in particular. Yet his books are far from any systematic scientific investigation of the topic. For example, a typical experiment for him is to ask his students to relax and look at an image and then state the first thing that pops into their minds. Then they go looking for hidden images, such as a dog's face, a phallic symbol, a human body embedded in a pool of water, a cluster of foliage, or ice cubes in a glass. In this book, he includes images drawn from advertisements that illustrate this process. For example, he claimed that the letters S-E-X appeared in the ice cubes in an old ad from Gilby's Gin. Another example that Key cited of this deviousness was in a Canadian ad for Janssen Swimwear, in which the ad features both a male and a female model wearing swimsuits, whose design motif paid homage to the then relatively new Canadian flag. According to Key, to the innocent viewer, it would make sense that the bathing suit ad focuses on the particular zone of the body that is covered, which was the pelvis and torso of both models. But Key then warns that there's much more to the ad. If this ad is inverted, alleges Key, then it's possible to see a face close to the woman's crotch. A face made up in a figure of water. Key states that a figure in the water is blowing directly into the woman's genital area, making the bathing suit much more appealing because it is subliminally not only sexy, but about sexual stimulation itself. 
It's examples such as these that comprise Key's claims. They come from his ever watchful eye and the eyes of his students whom he has trained to look for these embedded words and images. He argues that by exposing these techniques, we can eventually diffuse the advertising power harnessed over us. Key's later books continue to extend this message by showing the broader uses of such subliminal techniques. On the front page of the New York Times, for example, maybe to sell newspapers, possibly in ceiling frescoes of the Sistine Chapel to enhance Michelangelo's art, and, according to Key, most frequently of all, in advertising and marketing. Key claims that the Nabisco company intentionally bakes the word sex several times onto each Ritz cracker to make the damned things taste better. Wilson Brian Key had gone into retirement in Nevada, but not without contributing significantly to the perseverance of the idea of subliminal advertising. His very last book on the subject was published in 1992. The advertising industry has largely ignored this topic, rarely addressing the issue in any public forum. Yet the idea of subliminal advertising lives on, through our cell phones, through images, through the idea of backwards recorded speech and music. It seems to be more because the public wants to believe in it, rather than the fact that there is any genuine evidence showing it to be a technique being used by advertisers. As far back as 1990, the media went crazy with the revelation of a purported use of subliminal techniques by Pepsi Cola. The company had produced some new designs for what they were calling their cool cans. These cans had a more hip and artistic look to them, and they were intended to be used during this specific summer. When those cans were stacked in a particular manner, that same familiar trope, the letters S E X seemed to appear. Two of those Pepsi cans stacked on top of each other and turned just the right way apparently made the letters S-E-X appear, much like the letters that were seen in the original Gilby's Gin ad from 1971. In response to the claims that Pepsi had created and embedded lettering on their cans to potentially subliminally affect their users with the word sex, Gene Mead, the advertising manager for the San Diego Pepsi office, insisted that the cans were designed to be cool and fun and different, just something to get the consumer's attention. Todd McKenzie, another spokesperson for Pepsi at the time, claimed that the supposed subliminal message was nothing more than an odd coincidence. Subliminal scares since their very beginning, seem to have had this quality, which are whistleblowers that are certain of the intentionality of what they have found. While those who are allegedly supposed to be responsible for the embedded messages always deny and disclaim them. A simple rational assessment would seem to suggest that a company as large as Pepsi would be foolish indeed to risk the wrath of the public and certain outspoken conservative groups by pulling a marketing stunt such as this. With that thought being thrown out there, we have seen some very strange marketing techniques used by companies recently, such as companies marketing products to show that they take a stance as an ally or a company that is tolerant with people's lifestyles or sexuality. Much like we just discussed with Pepsi, a bold marketing move such as this can potentially gain the company a lot of support, but could also backfire, causing those that use the products to part ways with the company and possibly show backlash. Though marketing of that type is rarely subliminal, it does go to show that companies often put a lot of money, time, effort, and testing into their new products and marketing campaigns to try and ensure that their revenue stream is not interrupted or disrupted. Another frequent theme in the subliminal scare has focused on messages embedded in music. Either much quieter than the music itself, or only clear when played backwards, the idea of subliminal messages in music 
dates way back to the period of the popcorn episode engineered by Vickery. There have been claims about embedded messages in the music of The Beatles, Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, Ozzy Osbourne, and Jefferson Starship, among many others that have come out up to this current day. One of the better known examples of this sort of subliminal scare comes to us in the Beatles song, I'm So Tired, which is said to contain John Lennon's disguised voice saying, Paul is dead, man. Miss him. Miss him. Miss him. Another is in Pink Floyd's Empty Spaces. When played backwards, it is alleged to say, Congratulations, you have just discovered the secret message. Please send your answer to Old Pink, care of the funny farm. In addition to these claims about embeddings in music, some motivational tapes with subliminal messages are available for sale on the internet. One makes these claims. If you need relief from any physical pain, including headaches, backaches, PMS, chronic pains, this program is for you. It's a powerful tool that will help change your life. Subliminal messages have been used for years to reprogram and change consumers' unconscious minds. Now you can use the same process for pain relief. If you can watch a 12-minute DVD or listen to a CD, you can reprogram your unconscious mind to release unnecessary pain from your life. What do you all think? Are we victims of subliminal messaging? Subliminal advertising? Are we conquests by companies who are using subliminal messaging, subliminal advertising, and subliminal influencing to trick us, provoke us into acting a certain way, and potentially make us consumerist slaves to their products? Well, we can't be sure of that, but here at Alternate Reality Reading, we just want you to enjoy Enjoy, share, subscribe, enjoy, share, subscribe, tell your share, friends, subscribe, subscribe, share, subscribe. Share. We hope that you've enjoyed this installment on conspiracies and conspiracy theories. There are so many of these out there. We'd love to bring you some more. Let us know if you like this, and if you have any suggestions for other conspiracy theories that we can tackle in the future, we would love to hear them. Go ahead and post a comment about it. Until next time, take care of yourselves, and sweet dreams. dreams.